All right, 10 o'clock. Welcome in, everybody, to the Senior Design Seminar. A um, couple of reminders about what's going on for the class. Um, you do have your final design report uh, if you're finishing with 491, or your interim design report if you're continuing to 492, which is due in electronic form to me by the Monday of finals week, which is week 11. So that's only four weeks from now. So make sure that you're um, working with your advisor to come up with a nice um, design report document and kind of fulfilling all the requirements that they are laying out for you. Um, secondly, you will have oral presentations in finals week, and we'll do those on the Friday of finals week. I'm actually in the midst of scheduling those oral presentations right now. Your advisor should have asked you about conflicts for that particular Friday of finals week. Um, if they didn't, please uh, send me any conflicts that you might have the Friday of finals week, which is Friday, February 26th. Please send those to me like right now or very shortly after the seminar because I'm going to start making the schedule today for those oral presentations. So that's coming up as well. Those are the big two things I think you got to keep on your radar. Um, from my perspective, you might have some other things that your own individual advisors are giving you, but that's all um, I'm going to sort of require from you. Okay, today we have a kind of a special seminar and it's something that I'm going to go over. Uh, it was a seminar that was sort of requested by one of my colleagues, uh, one of the professors in the ME department, um, asked me to give a, a seminar on geometric dimensioning and tolerancing, uh, GDT for short. I think some of you have seen GDT in uh, your 1601 classes, at least had some basic introduction to geometric dimensioning and tolerancing in 1601, but we're going to talk a little bit more explicitly about it over the next, I don't know, maybe 30 minutes or so, I'll, I'll talk about it. Um, you might not have gotten a strict definition on like what it is, why it's useful, why to study it, um, all those sorts of things. So I want to maybe give 30 minutes of sort of practical information on what is GD&T. We'll look at some drawings. We'll look at um, some things on engineering drawings you may have not seen before that's like related to GD&T. And so I think um, this is as good a time as any to sort of talk about it, especially if you're thinking about like making prototypes for your senior design project. You have to make drawings and communicate things that are going to be fabricated. Probably a, a good time to have discussions about uh, GD&T and what it's used for. So I made some slides for this. They're actually available in um, sort of the Teams collaboration folder. If you want to take a look at those and, and maybe save those for future reference, I think maybe that might be a nice thing to do. Um, Otherwise, if you want to just follow, I'll, uh, I'll probably just be talking over the, the slides here today. So let's uh, do it. So here I've prepared some slides for um, GD&T. Maybe I'll share my other screen would be a little easier. Here we go. Okay, so geometric dimensioning and tolerancing. Um, GDT or GD&T or GD and T if people are speaking clearly, <laughs> um, is basically an idea behind how we want to communicate how parts are made in um, in the engineering world. OK, so what do I mean by that? Here's a general overview. Um, often when you're working as an engineer, the person who is going to make the parts that you specify is not necessarily you. OK, so you need some sort of language to communicate a part that you want to make to, let's say, a machinist who is going to make your part. And this is sort of like what GND and T is, right? It's more or less a system or a language that helps define engineering tolerances and dimensions communicating between you who might be designing the part and the machinist who might be making the part. OK, so it's like this symbolic language or the study of this like symbolic language or tolerances or all these things related to dimensional accuracy and precision that you might require of a part that is to be made. OK, so there are several standardized methods for how GD and T is approached. Um, most often people are adhering to the ASME Y14.5 standard, but there are some other standards that exist. Um, if you've ever gone into SOLIDWORKS and sort of like looked at some of the drawing standards or what they refer to as drafting standards, you will see that there's like a drop down list of all these possible standards that you can use for your tolerancing and your dimensioning of your particular drawings. Um, I think I actually like created a SOLIDWORKS um, sheet here, some like simple little part. Let me see if I can pull it up. Yeah, so I created a sort of a simple little part here. Um, in SOLIDWORKS just to kind of show this idea. 
Um, so you have, you know, some, I made this just like rectangular cube and you have like one inch by one inch. Uh, and if you go to the options menu here, there are, I, I, you can sort of pull down a list of these drafting standards. All right, so you get the general idea. Um, right, but the main idea is that there are these standards that exist to help us communicate what we want out of our machined part without actually like writing it in English. We have symbols and we have numbers and we have all these various language terms to sort of like define what we want as engineers, okay? Each of these standards has some slightly different rules, like how big your leader lines can be and how big your arrows should be and all that stuff. But the basic idea that they aim to achieve is all the same, okay? Now, um, why do you want to study this? Um, you may have talked a little bit about this in 1601, and I bet a lot of the stuff that I'm going to show over the next couple slides you've probably already seen. But really, uh, a reason why you should be at least exposed to it in this brief manner is that if you understand GD&T at a high level, you'll have a better understanding of machining processes and what can actually be made. I think some of you are familiar with, you know, milling processes and lathing processes and a bandsaw and a, you know, hand drill and all these sorts of things. But maybe you're not familiar with electric discharge machining, which is a process for making very tight tolerances if you need them. Or some of these other sort of advanced machining techniques that might need to be required if you have very high tolerances for your part, okay? So if you study GD&T more, you will get a better feel for what can actually be made and what is like a loose or a tight tolerance. And this is sort of like the next bullet point here is um, many engineers, when they're first starting out in the world, if they've not made a lot of parts to tolerance, they don't understand what a loose or a tight tolerance might be. And if you study GD&T, there's lots of charts that basically give you a sort of flavor for what is like a tight tolerance on a part and what is like a loose tolerance on a part. So if you're if you're a young engineer and you're specifying a tolerance of, you know, one thousandth of an inch for all dimensions on your part, well, the part's probably going to be super expensive to manufacture, going to be difficult to make to that particular tolerance and, and et cetera. So you have to kind of know and understand that there's an economic cost associated with some tighter loose tolerances. And what is a tight tolerance? What is a loose tolerance? Um, where can I go to find that information? That's a little another reason why you might want to study GD&T. Okay. Another reason is you need to know the language. If you're going to communicate as an engineer to a machinist, you need to know the language to get back what you expect. Okay. If you just give some machinist some document that doesn't have any tolerance or, or, or some information associated, that machinist just might assume a certain tolerance and make it to some specification that they think is correct. All right, you need to specify all the information if you want to get back the part that you expect. All right, and that goes with this next bullet point that is if you get back a part that you didn't specify properly, you're going to lose time, you're going to lose money, all these sorts of things. So you need to know on the front end how to properly communicate what you want using this GD&T language so that you can you know, eliminate associated time loss, money loss, so on and so forth. Another reason to study is you will be able to interpret drawings more quick, quickly and accurately. There are a lot of standard symbols that are used in GD&T, and if you don't know what those symbols are and someone places a drawing in front of you, you're going to be like, I don't, I, what is this? I don't understand what this is. I don't understand what this means. And that could be a problem, especially if you're kind of like on site and trying to interpret something from someone else that is made apart and they're talking to you about it and trying to communicate something about it and you're looking at this drawing like i don't know what the heck this thing is that's a problem okay um so there's that and then finally you'll be able to make drawings quickly and accurately if you know this all right last uh slide with a bunch of wall of text and then we'll actually look at some drawings okay so this is the last real thing i want to hammer home here and this is kind of the tenets of the gd and t standard um, and here they are basically written almost word for word from this ASME standard. First bullet, dimensions must be complete. Okay, you have to define everything in your drawing if you want that to come back properly. All right, each dimension in the drawing needs to have a tolerance. More on this in a second. No duplicate dimensions. So this is really easy to succumb to if you're not careful. And we'll talk about this in just a second. Um, this is a big one. And often a mistake that's made by young engineers is the manufacturing methods are very rarely prescribed on engineering drawings. The idea is you give an engineering drawing to some black box 
And that engineering drawing should not specify how that thing is made. It should just specify, this is what I want to come back. So think about like taking your drawing and feeding it into some black box, and then all you're gonna get back is the part that you specify. You shouldn't really be talking about exactly how you want it made in that drawing unless there's a very specific reason why it needs to be manufactured in that particular way. Um, I can't really think of any particular reasons to specify a certain manufacturing method off the top of my head. And maybe in communications with a machinist, if you're talking to one, you might suggest ideas of how to machine it. But if some machinist has been working and is an expert in the field and is a, you know, been doing it for 20 years, it's not your job. Or it's almost overstepping to tell them how, how it should be made. They know what they're doing. Okay. Let them be the experts. Let them machine it and understand it. All right. Dimensions arranged to provide optimum readability. That's just aesthetics. Um, dimensions shown in true profile view. This is something you should have talked about in 1601. 90 degree angles implied. Again, something you should have talked about in 1601. Less specified dimensions at 20 C and standard atmospheric conditions. That's because dimensions of objects change at different temperatures and pressures, obviously. And then coordinates are right-handed. So these are the big tenants that I think are, are important to talk about for these um, GD and T sort of rules or guidelines. All right. A lot of this, like I said, you might have discussed in 1601, but I, I want to give a definition and some actual formal things here. And it's, it's good to revisit it as a senior. You know, maybe you saw it as a freshman, but good to revisit again. Okay. So let's look at some drawings. Here is a drawing for a thing. All right. Now, uh, a lot of detail here and a lot of information here. A um, couple of things you probably can pick out right away on this drawing just from experience. Um, so you see things here like dimensions, which are pretty obvious to see and understand. Um, you see some holes, some hole patterns here, these dashed lines. Um, you see additional tolerances, which are given here with this particular dimension. But there might be some things on this drawing that you don't really know at this point. For instance, like why does this particular dimension have parentheses on it? Um, what is this thing? Okay. Um, what does that mean? All right, what's all this information down here? Maybe you know about that, maybe you don't. What is this capital A here with this you know, triangle filled in? What does that mean? Well, again, this is just sort of the language of GD&T that you might be expected to know if you're an engineer coming out of, out of school here. So um, let's talk about some of these things. Um, that drawing might have been a little bit difficult to see, so I'm kind of blowing up some of the features here and some of the images here. And again, you should be able to recognize a lot of these features after taking your 1601 class and maybe even having experience with looking at drawings and in, in some internships or things like that. But for instance, um, obviously it's easy to see that these are some through holes in the, in the piece, okay? And they have various dimensions called out, um, right? But again, what is this symbol over here? What does this mean? Um, why is there additional specification here for this particular hole and what does all this stuff mean? Um, it's very specifically included for a very specific reason. Um, okay, again, here, this is another view of that same drawing, but blown up a little bit. What are all these symbols here? What is this symbol? Maybe some of you can identify this as a, you know, a counterbore symbol. Maybe some of you can identify this as a, you know, down into the piece sort of symbol. Um, but what is this like circle M thing? What does that mean? Okay, these are things that you should like know and understand at this point coming out into the world. All right, so let's first get into it. And I'm gonna you know, start from the very basic ground and build up. Okay, there's a lot of this stuff, like I said, you're, you're, you're going to have seen in 1601. For example, dimensions. All right, you guys better know what dimensions on a drawing are at this point, but I wanna sort of establish the baseline here. All right, it's a numerical value that's on the drawing that tells you how you big or small you want that feature to be. Okay, so here are some examples. Um, right, you can give dimensions metric units, inch units, you can give dimensions for angles, etc. Okay. Each standard describes methods for how to include dimensions, but I think if you've ever done any drawings in your life, you probably understand what dimensions are and, and sort of what they look like. All right, tolerances. Tolerances you've probably also seen in your 1601 class. And so it's usually an additional piece of information given on the backside of a dimension that more or less tells you how much variability in the dimension that you specify is acceptable. So in this particular instance, the person making this part or the engineer that designed this part wants the dimension to be 1.375 plus or minus 0 0.005. So up to 1.38 or down to 1.37. Right. 
This is a direct tolerancing written right on this particular dimension. But most of the time when you look at engineering drawings, there's not going to be a tolerance specified directly like that. And if you do not have a tolerance specified directly on the drawing, that would tell you to use the sheet tolerance, which is like a global tolerance for that particular drawing, usually located on the bottom of the drawing that tells you what the particular tolerance is. So in this particular situation, we have a dimension with three digits behind the decimal point. So if I was curious what the tolerance of that might be, I go visit the tolerance block, which is here, and it tells me that if I have three places behind the decimal, then I want that tolerance to be plus or minus five thousandths. Okay, pretty easy to see and understand. And then the question that you might have, and you might not necessarily know this yet as a young engineer, is what really is a tight tolerance versus like a loose tolerance? Like is five thousandths tight or not? I don't know. And how expensive or difficult is it to manufacture five thousandths of an inch? I don't, you might not necessarily know, okay? So there are charts that exist that look something like this. This is a, for millimeters or for metric, but it's a general idea and a good guideline um, that basically tells you, all right, if I'm gonna specify a tolerance for a particular dimension, what would be considered like a very tight tolerance and what would be considered like a very loose tolerance, where the tighter the tolerance you're asking for, the more expensive and difficult it is to manufacture. So here you would see a chart that looks something like this. And so this is, you know, in millimeters. So how you want to read this is the Y axis basically tells you how tight or loose your tolerance is. So fine would be a very tight tolerance. Coarse would be a very loose tolerance. And then here on like the X axis of this chart, you have what is the dimension of the piece that you are or the feature that you're calling out, okay? So for instance, if I had some feature that was between 1,000 and 2,000 millimeters, so that's between one meter and two meters, then it would be a big ask for me to ask for a tolerance of that dimension to be plus or minus a half a millimeter, okay? So half a millimeter, man, think about that. That's pretty small. And so on a dimension that's 1,000 millimeters to ask for plus or minus one half millimeter is, is a pretty big ask. I mean, so if I thought about, you know, I got this piece of brass here in my office that I'm holding in my hands here. It's about, I don't know, a meter long, maybe a little more than a meter long. And if I was asking Roger at the machine shop to give me this piece and cut it to a length that's plus or minus half a millimeter, that's a pretty big ask to get him to, to use like, let's say a bandsaw and then like mill down one end to plus or minus 0.5 millimeters. It's a pretty big ask. But if I go to him and I say, hey, I don't really need a very tight tolerance. I just need a coarse cut well, plus or minus six millimeters. Okay, that's a quarter of an inch. I think that's reasonable even with just like a typical vertical or horizontal bandsaw to get to that very coarse sort of cut. Okay, so you get the general idea is that it would be much more expensive to manufacture this dimension to 0.5 millimeters than it would be, you know, 0.6 or that plus or minus six millimeters, which is about a quarter inch. Okay, so there you go. Um, you would see charts like this. This is for millimeters or metric. You would see some other ones that looked like this for inch if you just kind of do a Google search. All right, you get the idea. Um, you've probably talked about unequal tolerancing, but I'll just lay it out here and why you might see it or, or what it looks like. Unequal tolerancing is a situation where you're specifying, you know, that you can have a dimension that is either greater than or less than a value, but those greater than or equal than amounts are not equal. This is particularly common when you're thinking about like press fitting a shaft into a bearing housing would be one sort of example. If I was thinking about making a shaft and putting it into a bearing housing, I would probably specify that that shaft, I don't want the dimension to be less than what I'm giving. So I probably have some unequal tolerancing that would allow for additional material on that shaft, but would really limit, you know, going below that dimension that I give us, you know, by a certain value. That's because it's always easy to maybe sand down that shaft a little more to fit into the housing. Or, you know, if you are on the lower side of the tolerance, then and you're expecting a press fit, you know, you're going to put your shaft into that bearing housing and it's just going to fall right out. OK, so it might be a situation where you have unequal tolerancing. And I'm sure this is something you've probably seen as well. All right. Something that you may or may not have talked about in 1601 is this idea of chain dimensioning or tolerancing stacking. And this is a subtle one that is often overlooked in a lot of situations. And an idea that, okay, if I'm going to dimension something and use sort of the sheet tolerance for this particular piece, and let's say my sheet tolerance here is 0.2, um, I think this is millimeters, let's just say millimeters, 0.2 millimeters. Well, 
if I'm thinking of this dimension here, this dimension would then be read as, okay, I can accept 20.2 to 19.8 millimeters. So this dimension here would be 20 plus or minus 0.2. This dimension here would also be 20 plus or minus 0.2. This dimension here also 20 plus or minus 0.2. If they happen to all be on the low end, let's say 19.8, then you would have a stacking of tolerances that forced this long dimension to have this additional tolerance here. So this particular call out, if you're sort of going one feature to the next to the next, your tolerance stacking from, let's say, the left to the right hand side of this piece, because if I'm thinking about the final dimension of this guy, the tolerance for this particular piece is plus or minus 0.6, which is sort of three of these sheet tolerances stacked on top of each other. If what is critically important to me is the 60 millimeter dimension, Dimensioning it in this way would ensure that this particular dimension would be tolerance to plus or minus 0.2. So here now we have 20 plus or minus 0.2. Now this feature is 40 plus or minus 0.2. This feature is 60 plus or minus 0.2. So in this situation, all the dimensions you see here would be plus or minus 0.2. Now I'm not saying that this particular method here is bad. I'm saying that if what's important to you is the distance between, let's say, these features here, then okay, maybe you want to dimension these features as you see here. It's important to you that this step distance here is 20 plus or minus 0.2. Okay, we'll dimension it this way. But if what's important to you is the general overall width of the piece, well then dimension it in this fashion so that this particular dimension has that tolerance. Okay, so that's something to consider and it's a little subtle and maybe often overlooked. All right. Next would be direct dimensioning, and direct dimensioning is used when you have two features on a piece that you're very specifically interested in minimizing the tolerance. Okay, so let's say that I have a piece here, and I'm interested in minimizing the tolerance between feature X and feature Y. In this situation, I'm using a direct dimensioning between those two features, X and Y, to give me the tolerance here of plus or minus 0.2 with this particular feature. If I didn't do it in this way, if I did it in, let's say, this fashion, where I'm kind of going with the stacking idea, then I would have three sheet tolerances between X and Y. This could be 6 plus or minus 0.2, 10 plus or minus 0.2, 10 plus or minus 0.2. So between X and Y, I have a plus or minus 0.6 because I have three sheet tolerances that have stacked up. If I do it with this particular fashion, which is kind of going for one datum, which is the left-hand side here, I have two sheet tolerances to deal with. So this 10 plus or minus 0.2, and this 36 plus or minus 0.2 would give me the dimension between X and Y is 36 minus 10 plus or minus 0.4, all right? So that gives you a flavor of, again, this is better than this, but still worse than this. And so if you really care about two particular features, you want to direct, dimension those directly. Whole patterns, there could be a lot of information here on whole patterns, but aside from the traditional patterning or describing the dimensions of the holes where they're just dimensioned in the direct manner, you can have something like ordinate dimensioning, which is dimensioning from a datum. You can have tabular dimensioning, which is very similar to ordinate, except you're calling out um, holes in the chart here. Or you could have full chart dimensioning where you're giving the X, Y coordinates of these particular holes in sort of a rectangular coordinate system. And also the associated quantity and diameters of those particular holes. Okay, so hole dimensioning, something again, you probably should have talked about in 1601, I don't wanna beat it to death, okay? But, you know, I've talked about dimensions, tolerances, holes. We see all those things here in this particular drawing. So back to this drawing, back to reality. Oops, there goes gravity. Here's this particular drawing. And again, you see a lot of dimensions that are here without tolerances specified. So here, let's say this 1.6, there's no tolerance here um, versus um, some of these other guys here where there's a 2.5200 plus or minus 0 0.0015. Very specific tolerance for this particular dimension. Okay. And I'll draw your attention now to the tolerance block down here at the bottom where actually the tolerance is specified in this block. So I think so, many of you are familiar with this general idea where this is sort of like the global tolerance for the sheet if no tolerance is given. All right. So, for instance, if you're giving a dimension with two digits behind the decimal point, then your tolerance is plus or minus 0 0.015, 15 thousandths. Three digits behind the decimal point, five thousandths. 
for a whole, which is a very, very specific feature. Two digits behind the decimal, five thousandths. Three digits behind the decimal, three thousandths. Yikes. This is actually a, a, an unequal tolerance, plus 0 0.003 minus 0 0.001. Interesting there. All right, so you get the idea. All that stuff, I'm guessing you've probably seen before. And so many of the dimensions and the tolerances and all that sort of stuff on this drawing, fine. You've probably all seen that. I just want to sort of go slowly and build a foundation. Here again, that information sort of highlighted. Your standard dimension with a sheet tolerance, uh, a dimension with a modified tolerance. Here, information about a whole with what would be the whole sheet tolerance. Here, this is a reference dimension. Um, I didn't say this explicitly, but a reference dimension is um, one that just is information that's already been specified, but is given just as a as a reference. So if I were to think about this 5.6 dimension, this actually has already been sort of specified by um, another drawing view. We'll talk a little bit more about this later. OK, um, again, another drawing view here. And we see a lot of the, the things that I just talked about, dimensions, tolerances, etc. But now I want to talk a little bit more about what is this sort of stuff going on here. What are these? These are called feature blocks. What is that all going on here with that particular dimension? So let's get into that. The next thing I think it's important for you to know and recognize on an engineering drawing is datums. And a datum is basically like a line, a point, a feature, an axis, something on the drawing that is relatively important upon which where you are basing a lot of your dimensioning off of. All right, so datums are typically selected because it's an important face that's going to be used or an important feature that's going to be used um, in the end of the, you know, the final end use for the product. Or it might be used because you understand a machining process and you understand that it's easiest for the machinist if they're, for instance, working on a mill to establish a zero or establish a datum on their mill and take all their measurements from that particular datum. So if any of you have worked on a mill before and have used, you know, like a edge finder to find the edge and use that and set up your datum or your zero for like a CNC mill and then go on your business, it's it's a lot easier. Your life's a lot easier if you, the drawing that you're working with has a, a datum. All right. This is the most common form of datum symbol that is that is typically used. It's this darkened triangle extending from the surface or the, the feature of interest. And then dables are, datums are typically labeled with a letter like this. So don't worry about all these little uh, specifications for exactly how to create your datum, but this is generally what the symbol looks like. Here's some examples of datums being specified in an object. This would be like this surface being datum B, this surface being datum C, this surface being datum A. And you'll notice that the datum can be specified by the leader line of a dimension, which you see here, or directly on the surface. Both of them are perfectly fine. All right. So those are datums. Here are some common symbols that you see. I'm guessing, again, many of you have seen these and know and understand these. Things like a diameter symbol, a radius symbol. There are many other symbols that exist that you can use and will probably crop up over the course of your career when you're making drawings. Common ones, counter bores, counter sinks. That's for including socket head cap screws or machine screws. Um, to be flush against the surface. Typically, you'll have a countersink or a counterbore. Um, spherical radius, that's creating a spherical surface, so on and so on. Depth or deepness of a cut or a drill. This is a pretty common symbol that you should be familiar with. And then there are some other ones here as well for making slopes, tapers, so on. All right. Now, let's talk about feature control frames. Um, here's an example of a feature control frame, and it's sort of annotated with all of the information about what's going on with that particular feature control frame. Now, feature control frames are utilized when you need additional control over a particular dimension that the typical dimensioning wouldn't afford you. What do I mean by that? Well, maybe I need this particular surface to be parallel to this with some degree of accuracy. OK, I need a feature control frame to specify that. Maybe I need this surface to be perpendicular to this surface with a very specific um, dimensioning, and I need a way to call that out. And the way that you call that out is with these feature control frames. And so let's walk through what would be generally considered a very complicated feature control frame, which you see here. And we'll talk about what each one of these things means in just a second. The first thing that you'll run across in your feature control frame <clears throat> is a geometric characteristic symbol. And that is, <clears throat> 
Sorry, I got a frog in my throat here. That is the additional control that you require. What geometric control are you asking for? This particular symbol here has to do with the location of the piece, um, but there are other geometric characteristic symbols which we'll talk about in just a second. Things like parallelism, things like perpendicular, um, things like some, uh, sphericity, things like um, cylindricity, um, arc length, etc. There's a lot of additional things that you can specify in this first symbol tells the machinist more or less what specific thing am I interested in specifying with this additional feature control frame. All right, the next thing is the dimension that you're giving or the tolerance that you're giving for that particular geometric symbol. So what is read here is this is a positioning. And so I would read this as my positioning of this diameter must be within 0.13. That's how you read this particular initial bit of the, the feature control frame. So we need to locate the diameter within 0.13 of here's the maximum material condition. I'll talk about that in just a second. Relative to the backside here, you're specifying which datum. And you can specify multiple datums if multiple datums are important to you. So how you might read this is I need to locate this feature. The diameter needs to be 0.13 within the maximum material condition from primary datum A, secondary datum B within the maximum material condition, and tertiary datum C. A little bit complicated. So let's go back to, um, first let's talk about these geometric symbols and then we'll actually bring in our, um, our drawing back and show what some of those might look like. So some of the geometric characteristic symbols that you might see to help you specify additional information that you might need for a dimension have this sort of view. And so you can include straightness as your geometric characteristic symbol, flatness, circularity, singularity, profile, position, concentricity. And so that's if you have two holes right on top of each other. This is very common for like a counter bore or a counter sink in relation to a, a hole like a through hole. Um, parallelism, perpendicularity, angularity, etc. So let's look at some examples of this that were on the drawing from, from way back. Here's again a picture of the, the drawing from before, and we start to see some of these things. Here is the datum specified, particularly datum A. And so we see this symbol telling us that this particular feature, this particular line, this particular face, we're calling datum A on this particular object. All right, so now let's look at our feature control frame, which is here. This is a very simple one. Here, what this feature control frame is telling the machinist is that I need beyond just this dimension, which is 1.32 plus or minus 0 0.001, which by the way is an insane tolerance. Beyond this insane tolerance that I'm asking for, I also need this face to be parallel within 0 0.002 of datum A, which is this face. Okay, so that's how you want to read that feature control frame. So you're specifying that you need additional tolerance on that particular feature that it has to be parallel with a tolerance of 0 0.002 regarding or in relation to datum A, which is this phase, okay? So interesting information there, okay? Now, what does it mean to have a, a tolerance for parallelism of 0 0.002? Well, typically, if you're talking about inches, that would mean that I need this surface to be parallel to this surface with a tolerance of at maximum two thousandths of an inch for every linear inch of travel along this face. So what do I mean by that? Well, this dimension here is approximately 5.5 inches. Let's just say that. And so what that means is I need parallelism between this face and this face, which is two thousandths for every inch, which means that if this is approximately five inches in length, I need the parallelism between this face and this face to be 0 0.01 inches over the whole length of that particular feature. So there you go. Usually that straightness or flatness or parallelism is called out in the sheet tolerance. And that's what you see here as well. Straightness and flatness, this is sort of related to parallelism, by default is 0 0.005 inches per inch of linear material. So that's the idea here in this feature block. And that is sort of what's called out by this feature control frame here. 0.002 inches per linear inch. 
So that gives you a general idea. Now, looking at this particular image, you should be able to see some of those feature control frames and identify some of the like spicy things associated with this particular drawing. Okay, so here's a, a drawing which is very specific for this particular piece, and there's lots of feature control frames, lots of tolerances, and lots of information here, but after what I've just told you, you should be able to interpret basically everything associated with this drawing. Okay, so you have particular dimensions with various tolerances. Here, this is a datum location, so this particular face is datum C, which is important. Here, you see a very particular tight tolerance for this channel that's inside of this particular piece and it has additional specificity that means the location of this must be within 0 0.002 inches of the maximum material condition relative to datums a c and b interesting also this feature must be parallel with the tolerance of 0 0.002 relative to datum c so this feature and this feature must be must be parallel related to datum C with a tolerance of 0 0.002. Interesting. So they're calling additional specificity for this surface relative to these two surfaces here, specifically this top surface, okay? So a lot of additional information to be garnered from these feature control frames, right? If we take a look at this guy here, this is a tapped hole. So we have four tapped holes that look like 832 tappings. Um, this is a very specific notation or, or drill size for an 832. Um, this is a specification for the type of tap standard, UNC, down um, 0.535. So this is how far down we go with our tapping. And we have additional information in our feature control frame. The location of this, our diameter must be located within 0 0.07 of the, of the maximum material condition relative to datum A, C, and B. Looks like I might have a question. Uh, the box dimensions, critical dimensions. Um, yeah, so the box dimensions would would... Yeah, be critical dimensions, important dimensions. They're all sort of important dimensions. Um, I think the reason for the boxing here is just to tell you that it goes with the sheet tolerance. So you see um, critical dimensions, important dimensions, um, sheet tolerance important for these particular for these particular boxes. Yeah. OK, but again, we see some of these other geometric symbols like here, um, a counter bore and that counter bore must be located at a position of 0 0.014 relative to datum A, C, and B, et cetera. You get the general idea, all right? So you can take information that you've garnered here and apply that now to some random sheet or random drawing that you might now see in the future. And, you know, when you first stare at something that looks like this, it's kind of complicated. You got these weird angles, these weird uh, positions. You've got these feature control frames, but you can look up, all right, what is the symbol? What does this mean? Um, what does the tolerance for this particular symbol mean? B and C, okay, that refers to datum B and datum C. So whatever this feature is, it's got to be relative to datum B and datum C, all right? This hole has got some particular information associated with it, and it has unequal tolerance, 0 0.002 minus 0 0.000. So very specific tolerance here. We're calling for perpendicularity for this particular dimension with some specification. All right, so it has to be perpendicular to datum B, which is this particular face. So that makes sense that you're calling out this particular feature in this, you know, view of the object to be perpendicular to a datum, which is sort of perpendicular to that feature. Sort of makes sense. Okay, so there you go. This just gives you a flavor. Okay, now. This is going to be all I can really talk about. You see, we've already kind of gone 40 minutes, and I don't want to beat this to death. There are books that are written on GD&T, and I've really only give you a hint or really only give you a, a flavoring. And the more and more you do engineering drawings and engineering design, especially if you're going to be giving them or sending them out to machinists, the more and more adept you should be at creating drawings which have these specific specifications and interpreting drawings that you may see from other people with this information, all right? So I took everything from this particular book and this particular reference. I think it's good. It's based on the typical ASME standard, um, which I think is probably most commonly used these days. But there's a lot of information that I didn't really have a chance to cover related to GD&T, and that's things like what are material boundaries, maximum material condition, minimum material condition, degrees of freedom, mating fits, um, 
alternate standards, etc. I just want to give you a flavor and give you an understanding of what G and D and T is, give you a definition, why it's important, etc. And I'll leave you, this is the last particular slide, again, revisiting some of those fundamental rules. And I think if you're going to be an engineer, you should at least understand the bullet points that are on this slide. You have to have all your dimensions. Each dimension has to have a tolerance. You can't duplicate dimensions. You're not specifying how the part is to be made, only specifying what you want in the end. You got to arrange the dimensions to be readable, obviously. Have to have your dimensions in true profile view. So what I mean by that is if you go up to this particular image, you don't see any dimensions in this view. That's because this is an isotropic view and there are no faces that are sort of perpendicular to this particular view. And so you see all the dimensions in this view are rated to this face, which you're looking on in true view. And if you need to dimension something on the side of this piece, let's say in view AA, this has to be a straight on view that you're dimensioning. Okay. So you're not calling anything out in this view because that wouldn't be a true view for those particular features. You need the true view, which actually is this sort of alternative view of this piece, which is view AA. All right. So must be shown in true profile view, 90 degree angles, um, standard temperature and pressure, and then right-handed coordinate systems. If nothing else from this talk, please take away just these general bullets. All right, uh, that's gonna be it for the seminar today. Um, I hope you enjoyed revisiting your dimensioning and tolerancing. It's probably a rerun of um, 1601, but I think good to sort of pound it home, especially if you might be considering making drawings for your prototypes at this stage of your senior design. So thanks for coming. Um, on next Monday, we're gonna have some industry experts come in. Um, Adam and Tyler, a couple of friends of mine that actually do manufacturing of thermoplastic materials. Um, Tyler's an engineer and Adam's a salesman, and they're gonna talk about uh, effective ways to communicate engineering designs and um, effective uh, economics of engineering. So I think it'll be a nice a nice talk next week. Thank you for coming. Uh, I'll leave it here and we'll, uh, we'll see you next week.